Welcome to Renegade Inc, the talk show which allows us to think differently. If you create money at home, it's called counterfeiting. If an accountant cooks the books, it's fraud. But banks can and do create money or credit each time we take out a debt agreement with them. The production of money is actually a democratic act, driven by the trust that we have in the monetary system. So, in a transparent age, we ask who should have the privilege of producing our money and what should we get in return? In 2016, a survey of British politicians showed a significant proportion of them thought it was the Royal Mint who was in charge of issuing our money. This is the level of ignorance within the UK political class. So on this programme, we shine a much needed light on who actually produces our money. Joining me to walk through the credit fueled confusion are the founder of the banking platform Suscada and chair of Ecology Building Society, Stephen Round. Also, the writer and economist and friend of the show, Anne Pettifer, uh, who's just written an excellent book called The Production of Money. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank for you. coming by. Um, Steve, start with you. When you look out at the UK banking sector as a whole today, and we've only got a half hour show, <laughs> um, what do you see? I see the potential of a very good uh, system. Unfortunately, it just isn't working very well uh, for, for many millions of people. I think if you see now the changing uh, environment where banks, new banks, challenger banks are, are, are coming on board, but the reality is that actually access to finance for many people and small businesses is becoming more and more difficult. I think that's the challenge for us all, is how do we actually, as a developed world, and a developed economy actually ensure that we are offering first class products and services to as many people as possible rather than the chosen few 10% where everyone seems to be challenging at. What are the blockages? Is it regula regulate regulatory capture? As chairman of the building society, I would, I would always say that regulation can be very painful, but I don't think we can blame the regulators per se for, for all of that. I think the reality is appetite for actually change. I think everyone is now going for an easy option. What is that easy option? The easy option is let's create a new banking platform, let's reduce branch networks, let's use technology to enable people to access financial services. There are many, many people who actually are not capable of actually accessing those financial services through technology. Why is that? Because well, of their I, digital literacy? Uh, uh, yeah, a mix of digital literacy, uh, fear, uh, concern, and also uh, choice. We're in a situation now where the UK banks, uh, I think, are praising themselves for having four million basic bank accounts. The reality is it's a product and a service that the banks don't want to deliver and most people don't want because the actual flexibility in that product is not very good for most people. The advent of universal credit, hitting a lot of those people about the ability to budget and whatever, the banks are really not trying to deliver at that level at all because of profit, let's be blunt. So let's get to social purpose then, because profit, if it becomes uh, all about profit, that uh, supersedes social purpose every time. One of the concerns I have when we talk about social purpose or, you know, or, or um, doing the right thing um, is that bankers pay at lip service and it's a nice to have yep. as opposed to a must have um, to talk us through this, because I know you've given it some thought. The reality is, I, I, I don't think we should mix social purpose with charity. I think the point is about it's a good, good business practice. Now, in the UK, we have building societies who are mutually owned organisations. Um, only now 46, 47 left. But that doesn't mean that actually you can't offer a really good value service to individuals but actually look at long-term profit rather than short-term. Banks generally and, and, and pension funds and the like are looking for returns every year. It's difficult to actually plan a, a whole distribution strategy aimed at creating value over a period of time. Things are changing. Banking but, used to be about time. But how do you buy yourself time when you've got Q1, Q2 reports? It's about understanding what business you're in. Now, I, I grew up in a, in a time where banking was about providing financial access to financial services for the majority of people. I think banks are getting more and more focused on not doing that. The reality is, I think they're blaming the regulator, which I do all the time, which is always nice, but the reality is they're not the cause of all the issues. They just make it easy for them to, uh, that we can complain against. But there has to be a change, and that's both internationally and, and in the UK. This myopic... Um, the focus on on the short termism initially, yeah. and also when you look around the, the UK banking sector, 
Th those two things. Just, just describe what you see from an economist's point of view. Of well, where I think we're zooming at. out and looking at the, the whole system, first of all, we need to acknowledge that it's a public good. It's like good sanitation or clean water. These are things that are absolutely essential to the health of an economy, which is why we invented banking. We invented banking to lend money into the real economy at affordable rates. Before we invented British banking in 1694, people with bright ideas would have to go to the, to the robber baron who lived at the top of the hill and beg for money. Feed. Yeah, and be charged excessive rates of interest, usurious rates of interest with a banking system. Borrowing and lending was sort of democratised, you know. It was easier to get a loan, and you got a loan on the basis of the viability of your project, not on whether or not you know, the robber baron fancied your daughter or not. Do you know what I mean? Was that a criteria? No, <laughs> probably. It probably was a criteria, <laughs> yes. But now we're in a, in a world where 80% of all lending by banks, by the big global banks, is for speculation. They don't want to invest in the real economy because that takes time, as Steve has just said. And that takes patience and that takes going along with your, your real clients, with people you know, making the economy work. Instead, they can just gamble on whether or not property prices in London will move up this far or down that far, or whether or not uh, swaps on interest rates will edge up this minor amount or down that minor, and on the basis of that make billions of bucks. And so effort. why on earth would you invest in the real economy? And our regulators, our policy makers, our politicians sit on their hands and say, well, that's fine. You know, the, the market is sorting it. Well, I mean, that makes a very good point there. I mean, when I first started in banking, uh, at lending to, to, to individuals and to actually uh, small businesses, we used to have an acumen, which was Campari. And the first two things were character and ability. Yeah. That's what we used to look at, character and ability. Not means to pay, character and ability were the first two. Yeah. That's gone. That's it really gone. has. Computer says no. Well, absolutely. And, and, and the, the infrastructure of banks across the world has done that. And it's very difficult where you've come with a great project and you are a talented individual, you've got ability, you've got a, a team around you. It's easy to say no and, and, and take the easy option, let's speculate on, on asset-based, yeah. speculative lending. On pre-existing assets. Yeah. In other words, you don't have to help create new assets. Agreed. You gamble on existing assets. Yes. In property in London is one of the most fixed pre-existing assets there are. I get so frustrated with economists who talk about the supply and demand for housing. If you reduce the amount of finance being pumped into the property market in London, suddenly we wouldn't have a shortage of housing. It would all change quickly. Yes. The shortage comes about because most housing is unaffordable. Yes. There's an awful lot of housing in London that's empty. People are based in Malaysia, buying a, a property off yep. plan and sitting on it because owning that property enables them to leverage additional borrowing. But they don't just do that with property, they do that with works of art. You know, they'll go and buy a Picasso, shove it into some vault somewhere in Dubai, you know, where it's kept cold temperature, nobody ever sees it, of course, and use Picasso to leverage additional borrowing. Because, you know, you'll tell the, the creditor that one day you'll be able to sell your Picasso and pay back. So what's remarkable um, is the fact that post-crisis, that deleveraging has still not happened. And we, we, it's just happened in a minor way, we, but actually we've built up even more credit and, and But the regulator, and by their inaction, surely is saying implicitly a vast bubble is actually an optimum market condition. Let's just keep going. So where yeah. does this end? Where do, well, you're, you're a practitioner. Where does this end? And give us a date, and if okay. you're wrong, we'll hold you to it. <laughs> yeah, my understanding is there are a number of banks going through regulation now to set up. The regulator is more concerned that they have enough capital that when they do fall over, that actually that's fine. They're not actually caring about what is being done, what they're doing in their yeah. business plan. I think that's going to happen sooner rather than later, to, to, to be blunt. There's been lots of debates by, in the sector from traditional banks Ambulance site is that the new entrants have had slightly easier rules to come in and whatever, they've got great business plans, maybe, maybe not. But actually, the, as long as they have enough capital to fail, that's fine. That seems to me a very naive way of looking at business because yeah, that has yeah. a massive impact on the whole of us doing business. It really does. You lose confidence in the system. I mean, Anne writes in a, in a book about trust about the concept that really you've got to trust the infrastructures that are around you. And we've had that the last, since the crash anyway, people distrusting and whatever. And I think that's going to get worse if, if yeah. that happens. I believe yeah. that. That speaks exactly to your thesis in your book, Production of Money, doesn't it? Yes. Well, so the, the thing is that mainly because of ignorance, because most of us don't really understand money, 
these guys can get away with this and the regulators can get away with doing foolish things like uh, insisting on capital ratio, which doesn't top, stop the bank from gambling. No. In fact, their, their intention to gamble now is much stronger because they've got British taxpayers, German taxpayers, on the hook. American taxpayers on the hook. So why on earth you know, would you want to grow tomatoes when you can grow credit and never lose, basically? So this starves the real economy. This starves the real economy. But it comes down, in my view, to public ignorance. And, okay. you know, as you said at the beginning, Ross, the fact that, that politicians don't understand. Money is not a commodity. It's not gold. It's not silver. It's not cigarettes. It's a promise to pay, as Schumpeter famously said. And in that sense, it's just a social construct. I promise to pay you, you promise to pay me. And we do it every time we use a credit card. We go into a shop, we show the credit card. If we're credit worthy, it's probably got a fancy colour like gold. If we're not that credit worthy, we probably can't spend that much on it. If it's a gold credit card, you can probably spend more. If it's platinum, you're probably a Saudi princess. I think that's black. And oh, is that they're, black? They're the black cards oh, the black without one. anything right. on them. I've got a So, But what happens is you hand over this card. The card says this person is credit worthy. You then uh, acquire purchasing power. The shopkeeper uh, makes a sale. You then take the card and you put it back in your pocket. It's not the thing for which you're exchanging, it's a thing by which you are exchanging. Right. And it's a promise. If, if you default on your promise to pay your credit card at the end of the month or whenever, you know, there's a default. And that's all it is. And when we understand that, we understand that this is a matter of our relationships with each other. The banks would love to commodify yeah. that property and gamble on it. Yes. But it's not a commodity. It's a social, me and you, we trust or we don't trust each other. But we do have to have the institutions that uphold that trust. So there's got to be a criminal justice system which says she going to pay and uphold that contract. And if you go to countries, as I've done in many parts of Africa, where they don't have criminal justice mm. institutions, judicial systems, an accounting system, or even a, an independent central bank, there is no money. Right. Is this why you're dim on Bitcoin, if I can put it that way? Oh, God. Because, I, look, and I just know it's going to come up in this programme. Oh, someone will write in and say, but you didn't mention Bitcoin. So can we just very quickly mention it and move on? Because if you promise to protect me you're going from to get, Bitcoin... You're going to get some rap. <laughs> and we'll protect you. You're oh, safe here. Dear. It's based on the same mythology that surrounds gold, which is that... I mean, I was on a debate recently with Jim Rickards, who says gold is money. Gold is representative of something. If you've got a bar of gold, everybody knows you're rich. But it's not money itself. It's not the yeah. promise to pay. But the point is, the great thing about gold is that it's finite in supply. And, and that, for me, is its huge weakness. If it were money, you could only have as much economic activity as there was gold in the vault of your bank. Same with Bitcoin. It's been created and designed to be finite. But the idea of it being finite is that it has scarcity value and therefore the price of it must ultimately always rise. And the ones who are pushing the price up are generally the ones who... They've got a vested interest. I yeah. think what's interesting about Bitcoin is the technology. I mean, forgetting just the Bitcoin itself, but the blockchain yes, technology, the blockchain. that actually is a really good technology. I mean, for, for, for our point of view in Sascada, we're working in a project in Africa, bringing farmers, warehousing and, uh, and the exchange together. And part of that, we will be using some of the technology around blockchain because that, that really is a secure technology. And a lot of banks are looking at that in their own right. Yeah. So. Bitcoin bad, blockchain good? Blockchain very yes. good, yes, and very exciting. And yes. it has a lot of potential. So that has been the really good thing that's come out of Bitcoin. It's a good place to leave the first half. Thank you both very much. Join us after this short break for more from Stephen Round and Anne Pettifer on who should really benefit from the production of money. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more with Steve Round and Anne Pettifer about creating a monetary system that would actually benefit society, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc. index. We start, as ever, with our favourite tweets. The first is from at one young world, noting the ever-inspiring Muhammad Yunus on harnessing your entrepreneurial skills. Yunus says, I keep telling young people that we're not job seekers, we're job creators, we are entrepreneurs. Next up is from at Corporate Europe, money for nothing and pollution for free. 
hashtag ECB. It's the European Central Bank investments continue to back climate change criminals, they claim. And um, something you've written about in yeah. production of money. Increase of consumption. There's a link, there's a clear link. There's a link between easy money and easy consumption. Absolutely. It's very simple, maybe too simple for people to get their heads around. Third up is from at QE for People. The ECB is giving away 60 billion euros a month through quantitative easing, but cannot rescue the citizens of Europe, question mark. For your Greek, that's particularly pertinent. In fact, if you're any European, it's totally pertinent. And finally, at New Yorker Cartoons, the perfect reason for why you haven't completed your homework, yes, sir, the Russians hacked it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and according to the mainstream media, uh, what they haven't hacked isn't worth talking about, but that's a, a different story. Our book of the week this week is What Money Can't Buy by the political philosopher Michael J. Sandel. He says markets and market values have come to govern our lives as never before. The book is particularly relevant if you think that not much more than half a century ago, economics was more of a humane discipline whose roots lay in moral philosophy and history. The book challenges our acceptance of the market uh, in all our lives and asks whether or not we should allow sponsorship and incentivization of everything everywhere at any time. Sandel argues that perhaps there should be some things that money isn't able to buy, and we agree with his outlook. Now, it would be rude not to plug a second book of the week, which is uh, by Anne Petter for the production of money, and congratulations on it. How to Break the Power of Bankers. It's a great read, uh, and every bookshelf should have one. We're not on commission. Just, I just want to clear that up. <laughs> just want to clear that up. There's been a trend among writers and journalists to, to write books that are interesting for insiders. And we should write far more books that are interesting for outsiders. So you say, okay, so five years ago I knew nothing about banks, and so I was where you are. So that's where we're going to start. I'm not going to pretend that if I explain in one tiny sentence what private equity, hedge funds, investment banking, mergers and acquisitions, that from then on you'll remember. I'm going to write it in such a way that by the end you feel more knowledgeable rather than less. In Dutch it's called verheffing and it, it also means to, to elevate. It's the old What's social the word? Uh, verheffing, so it, it's to elevate people. It's the old social democratic ideal of uh, of that if you help people to educate themselves, they will want to educate themselves. They've been continually underserved with just knowledgeable and accessible information. In the production of money, you do some for heffing. Yes, absolutely. Uplifting people to say, actually, it's not that complicated. Exactly. You just need a bit of patience yeah. and, and, and an inquiring mind to really understand this. And you know, Ross, I, I got my inspiration for that from, from the Jubilee 2000 campaign, when we began to talk about we need a campaign to cancel the debts of the poorest countries. Everybody said to me, oh, no, you can't do that. It's very complicated. It's the international financial architecture, the international complicated, you know, and then there's multilateral, bilateral and blah. It's the very, language. And what about net present value? Oh, very <laughs> difficult concept. We found that all you needed to do was to send people little briefings, you know, bullet points on one side of a page, and they quickly got it. And what was wonderful was the Treasury came to me and said to me, what is going on here? <laughs> they said, we get letters on pieces of pink paper with bunches of roses in the corner. Dear sir, will you please explain to me Uganda's cut-off date debt being at this rate? He said, how do they know about Uganda's cut-off debt? I said, it's not complicated, it's not rocket science. Tell the housewife at her kitchen table about the stuff. She is smart, she understands. Mm. But if you keep it a secret, naturally, she's not going to be able to act or act. And we can't, we can't transform something until we understand it. And so what the finance sector is, is one of the best kept secrets in the world, really. And my mission is to break all that open and say, no, sorry, it's not a big secret, it's not complicated, it's not science. You know, it's basic concepts and you and I and everyone can understand it, honestly. If I can understand it, I can assure you we have lots of people can understand we it. We have, I'm just a quick diversion here. Yeah. Uh, we have batteries of researchers on the show, as you know, you know, ha aircraft hangars full of them. Um, and we did some digging on you. Um, oh my goodness. And, yeah, and a little bird told us that the successful Jubilee campaign, 2000 campaign, is it true that Muhammad Ali came to you and said that you're the most incredible woman and thank you very much for doing this? Oh, don't make me cry. He did. He did. And you know what he did? He was, he was, I mean, he was very ill already and hardly able to speak. But when I said goodbye to him, he lifted me up like this so that we were eyeball to eyeball. And he said, don't ever give up on your fight, you know. Oh! <gasps> 
Were you to tempted? this day, it makes me go cold, really. I mean, and he was terribly strong, you know. Yeah. Were you he tempted was... just to have a... No, no, no. I wanted to kiss him, actually. <laughs> um, for heffing, lifting up, yeah. literally, literally. And, and metaphorically and educationally. My book is aimed at women and environmentalists, and it's aimed at saying to them, you've got to get the grip on this because it affects you. You know, this whole idea that actually money is for the boys or those chaps in pinstripe suits in the city of London, and actually it's beyond you and me. That is a conspiracy because you are profoundly affected by the way those guys are messing up the system. And it's about time you got to understand it. Who, who produces money? We've discovered that banks create money out of thin air. Right. But actually, no money can be created until you or I apply for a loan. Right. So actually, we create the money supply. When the economists try to tell you that it's done by the central bank or the government, they're talking rubbish. You are responsible for the money supply. So why aren't we getting the benefits of issuing money? Because I've read chapter six yes. of your book and you say that the bank should keep that privilege. Yeah, I do. Well, but why shouldn't we the people have that privilege? Because the point is we, A, we apply for a loan. Yeah. We need it to be managed. We need someone to assess our risk. You know, are we fraudulent? Are we a bunch of crooks or are we for real? Are we really going to do something productive? It used to be an old clerk, a bank clerk, who'd sit there and look at your records and... That can be a job done by, by the government. You know, you could appoint civil servants to do that job, but I just don't see the point of it, really. And then we want to move our money around and we want to shop there and do this and do that. But why do the... And the banks facilitate Fine, that. but why do they get the kickback? Because it is an exorbitant privilege. To, to... Yes, it is, but, but, but that's why... because we've given them that... In, when I say we, mainly politicians and regulators, have said they can both do that and they can also use that money to gamble with, basically, to speculate with. I want us to separate those two things out again so they get back to the old boring business of lending, which is not massively profitable, as Steve says. It's hard to make a profit out of that. And then if they want to gamble, they do that as an, under a separate heading, a separate company and just get back to this ordinary business of providing affordable finance. And for that to happen, the central bank, the government, the treasury have to manage the banking system. So I don't believe in having a private commercial banking system that behaves like any old company. When we devised the banking platform for the change account, which was aimed at um, mainly people on low income, what was interesting, we, we built uh, wallets within the account so people could budget. And in the first nine months, 70% uh, of the people who took it out were women because of the budgeting element. What that showed me to some extent, that actually it was about the practicalities rather than the forward thinking. It was about let's, let, let's manage debt. I mean, because one of the issues we've got is how do people borrow money anyway? Yeah. Real money at very low interest rates. One of the things that we've done within the big issue, which, which I chair the foundation, is a rental exchange, a database of people who pay their rent. If you pay your rent, every day, every month for the past 20 years, where does that go on your credit rating? It doesn't. Well, it's starting to do now because we're building that in, but it doesn't. That it's is a very a, good it's an indicator. It's a very good indicator. Mm. It hasn't got the collateral, but actually you know yeah. that if someone has done that for 10 that years... They're reliable, they're trustworthy. Absolutely right. So there's your social blockchain aspect, it's, it's because actually you can see this guy's trustworthy, this woman's trustworthy, OK, yeah. I'm going to take a punt. Character, ability. Yeah. But practically, what has happened is the banks haven't taken out a book. You know, Ross, we bailed out the banking system <laughs> to tune of... I mean, what was it for RBS? £46 billion? Pounds? Yes. That's a huge amount. And, and that's what we know about. And oh, yeah. there were no terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. We should have said, we'll bail out the RBS, we'll look after their shareholders, but the terms are, thou shalt lend... Yes to the poor, thou shalt lend to the real economy, yes. thou shalt not do this. And if you don't like it, RBS, you can't have the taxpayer funding. Sorry, you can't have taxpayer guarantees, you can't have easy money from the Bank of England, QE, and you can't have the Bank of England's very low rates of interest. Of course, if you don't want that, that's fine by us too. You could manage on your own in the <laughs> private sector. But instead, what we did was we bailed them out and we said, no terms and conditions. Can you imagine? But why is there such a vacuum of leadership here? I don't know, it's, it's ignorance, it's, it's fear, and I blame the economics profession, Ross. Go on. You know, because... <laughs> There's not a week goes by <laughs> where we don't take a pot shot at this no, lot. No, but the point is, you know, people like Alistair Darling and Gordon Brown may know something about economics, but they were never taught about money, banks and debt, because there's no money, banks and debt in economics courses. Well, there's no more boom and, and bust, apparently. No, and that's why we have a student insurgency saying, hang on a minute, we do think money, banks and... Can you imagine? It's like... 
studying agriculture without doing anything on the land or studying the sea without understanding water. People talk about intellectual education and, and practical people. I don't think there is that. Of course, there are people at extremes on both levels. But actually, generally, there's got to be people in the middle who are actually thinking and doing. But that's, yeah. who, you, but that's who you're talking about. Because that's the react. That, that, those are the people. You know, I, I spent most of my life trying to come out with solutions that are not niche, but actually are open for, for, for many people. Because I always come across people who are very intelligent. My 3,000 big issue vendors, yeah. they understand that they pay £1.25 for a magazine and they sell it for £2.50. Now... What basic economics do you really know after that? So I, I put some money aside for my hostel and whatever. And we can get all tied up with acronyms. You talked about what the bankers talk about yeah. and the IMF. It, this is not rocket science. Most women handle the, the family budget and manage the family budget. And they therefore know, they understand, you know, they understand about debt and credit. They understand about income and, you know, what's coming in, what's not going, expenditure and so on. People will have really, I think, understood what, what you've both said and understood the need to get the banking system moving again and, the under and God, understood to get the economists to start thinking in real-world terms. Yes. How do we end? Give us some positivity of, of how we get well, out I of this. Well, I think there's a, there are movements out there yeah. of understanding that things have gone badly wrong. That we, would, we were all so shocked after 2007, we were stunned into silence, really. This ain't going to happen again. People now have a, a sense that there's some very grave injustice out there. And there's a, a, an insurgency against it. There's uprisings. Donald Trump represents that. Brexit is about that. What's happening in Europe is about that. The question is, will we be able to channel that anger now into something positive, into a transformation of the system? I don't know whether or not the financial system and the regulators and the politicians are going to catch up quickly enough with what's happening in order to correct all those imbalances before the people revolt even more. But I suspect they're beginning to get the message that there's something very wrong and it has to be fixed, and that's a good thing. And congratulations on the book. Thank you. Congratulations on uh, the many, uh, Mr Skada, but also <laughs> your building society, Ecology. Thank you both for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com, or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Stay curious.